Hi, my name is Peter Beckwith. I've been working with Dr. Hang for about 21 years now, and I wanted to tell you just a little bit about him before he begins his webinar. Bill was trained in traditional orthodontics. Earlier in his career, he became very concerned about the effects of retraction on facial aesthetics in the jaws. Back in those days, he wasn't quite aware of what was going on with the airway. That would come a little bit later. But he did start looking for a better way to treat than how he was taught in dental school, and he found orthotropics, which is a facial growth guidance technique that has been shown in the refereed literature to improve the airway. Bill's been treating orthotropically for 28 years and has been reopening extraction spaces for 29 years. He's also been lecturing around the world for 25 years. Dr. Hang's practice is focused on airway optimization, TMJ health, and facial balance. He has patients from over 25 states, several Canadian provinces, and countries all over the globe. His major focus at this point in his career is on early treatment, non-retractive orthodontics, and reopening extraction patients. Bill's focus is all about showing people like you how to do things you are told are impossible. Today's talk will be an overview of, of his treatment philosophies and a little bit of a precursor of what's to come in his upcoming seminar in Las Vegas in September of this year. Dr. Hank. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I'm glad to be here and share with you some ideas that I've developed uh, over the last uh, several decades. The slide you see before you is called air awakening. It's a term that I uh, coined several years ago because I wanted to raise awareness in the dental profession <clears throat> uh, about the fact that I think airway needs to be considered in every one of our dental patients. Uh, so the idea is that we're awakening the dental, uh, dental profession to the fact that airway means a lot. Uh, the tagline here is moving dentistry straight, meaning straight teeth, that's kind of nice. That's what I was taught to do, but it's certainly not what I want to be remembered for. Uh, forward, which is an even more important thing because most of the fa most orthodontic treatment moves teeth backward or at least fails to move it forward. But if you look in the literature, you'll see many of the faces get longer and the teeth are moved back with active retraction or retraction is done inadvertently. And finally, right to the center of health care. Uh, I believe dentistry should be the center of health care because we are the, the gatekeeper of the airway and facial growth, facial balance affects the airway dramatically. That's what this seminar is all about. So the airway awakening philosophy here in the next slide is that we're going to have an overview of orthotropics, which is something we do on growing children age 3 to 10, and non-retractive orthotics for patients of all ages. Now, I happen to believe that we've entered the post-retraction world of orthotics. There are many people in the sleep community who that are really not very happy with what they see with retractive orthotics. These are physicians who treat sleep apnea patients and have connected the dots and understand that the last thing that people need is to have things pulled back in their face. So I'd like to share with you ideas which have come to me and treatment, treatment methods that I've uh, come up with over the last several decades. <clears throat> Here's a classic kind of a patient that many of us see in orthodontics, and I, uh, my practice, I see these kids all the time because they're referred in for a second opinion. This boy has had someone recommend that, that say that he needs to have four bicuspid teeth taken out. And of course, we can have a nice argument in the profession about that. That argument has actually been raging in the profession for more than 100 years. For anyone who knows the history of the orthodontic profession, it's still not resolved. That's, in my opinion, that's not the proper argument to make. We need to talk about what is the, anybody's treatment do for the airway. In this particular boy's case, we disagreed with the need for removal of teeth, although in my earlier years I would have taken out teeth like everybody else. But that wasn't really the point. I knew I could make the boy's teeth straight, but I wanted to focus on his poor rest oral posture here uh, and the fact that he was a chronic mouth breather. To me, that was more important than getting his teeth straightened. We did our thing and we straightened our, his teeth for him, but sadly he pretty much ignored his poor rest oral posture. So here he is with straight teeth. You can argue whether, whether teeth should be taken out or not. That's not my point. The point is he still has poor rest oral posture. And because of that, his face has fallen back dramatically like many of your kids or your grandkids and many other kids. He doesn't look any different than most kids in schools in the United States or Canada or, frankly, any Western uh, country, an industrialized country. This, then, is a picture of him laying on a couch. Taken, this picture is taken on a cell phone 
uh, of his mother showing him while he's sleeping. And here he is snoring, and some of you may laugh, but in reality, this isn't even minutely funny. Snoring is not funny. Snoring is deadly. So we'll stop that. We'll show you, here is his airway. Uh, you'll see that he has a very narrow airway. Uh, you see the cross section there. You see that in his case, the narrowest part is the soft palate. So what do you do in a case like this? When, <clears throat> do, you, do you know, uh, can you predict, does he have sleep apnea or not? Can you predict that from an x-ray? The answer is no, you really can't. But if you could choose your airway, you'd always want to choose a bigger one. Here we have, from the refereed literature, David Hatcher's article, and he'll help us understand who is more likely to have sleep apnea. Uh, he indicates that anyone who has less than a 52 millimeter minimal cross-section area has a high probability of having sleep apnea. If you're from 52 to 110 square millimeters, you have a moderate probability, and above 110, you can have less of a probability. Now, I, again, I've seen patients with less than 52 millimeter, square millimeters who do not have apnea, and I've seen people who have over 250 square millimeters who do have sleep apnea. Nevertheless, the chances are greater if it's smaller. He has a minimum cross-section of 65.2, and he has a diagnosis with a sleep test of obstructive sleep apnea. And you say, well, that's no problem at all. Just let him wear one of these contraptions for the rest of his life, and he'll be just fine. He'll live a, quote, normal life. The answer is, really? How do we know that? Do we really know that for sure? So out of the refereed literature here from New England Journal of Medicine in August of 2016, here's a study <clears throat> from the University of Flinders uh, where they were surprised to find not a reduction in cardiovascular events. In other words, it does not decrease the chance that someone is going to have a heart attack or stroke. They may feel better, and that's great, but it doesn't decrease their chance of a heart attack or stroke. And this is another one of those quotes that I've gotten over the last 20-some years of going to seminars. Untreated sleep apnea results in a 20% reduction in a person's life expectancy. And that's what he's facing. Uh, even with sleep, with the, the, the CPAP, if he were to wear it, he would still not have a less of a chance of uh, stroke or heart attack. Four years ago, Michael Gelb uh, wrote a great article which was published in the California Dental Association Journal called Airway-Centric TMJ Philosophy. And Michael is a good friend of mine, and I like this article a lot. Let's look at what he has to say. The airway governs our ability to breathe and achieve a restful, oxygenated, restorative night's sleep, as well as to perform optimally during the day. Any TMJ or occlusal philosophy must address the airway patency while managing pain and dysfunction, identifying contributing factors and alleviating perpetuating factors. The teeth are the last piece of the airway-centric paradigm. The airway is the first, then the joint and muscle, and lastly, the occlusion. This is the son of Harold Gelb, who gave us the Gelb 4-7 position and who focused most of his career on proper position, position of, the, of the condyle and the fossa and always talking about centric relation. My point here is, is when Michael Gelb says we're concerned about airway centric, uh, what he's really saying is if you don't fix the airway, nothing else gets fixed. <clears throat> so how would we define airway centric? Uh, orthodontics, and airway-centric is a term that Michael Gelb has trademarked, and he's given me permission to use. I define it minimally as something which would not decrease the airway even minutely, and more optimally, it would be something that would actually increase the airway. Since many of our patients, from uh, even from uh, kids who are just uh, two and three years of age, have horrible airway problems, and some even at that age have sleep apnea, but certainly many of the adults have apnea we need to increase their airway to help them live a normal life. I talked with Michael about his article, and I said that is a great article, a seminal article that should go down in the history of the profession as turning a corner and calling, of calling for a new kind of a profession. But I said to him, we need to write an article which begins to give uh, orthodontists and dentists the exact things they can and cannot do. And so together, Michael and I wrote this article called Airway-Centric TMJ Philosophy and Airway-Centric Orthodontics Ushers in the Post-Retraction World of Orthodontics. 
This is published in Cranio uh, a year ago. And all of the specifics are in that. Uh, if you want to go to that article, you can, you can see all the specifics in that article. Uh, bottom line here is uh, I've, I've gone to a lot of seminars and heard some of the best names in sleep, and John Remmers, Harvard-trained physician, uh, was one of those people I heard early on. He said, uh, OSA's uh, structural narrowing of the pharynx plays a critical role in most, if not all, cases of sleep apnea. I had a nice discussion with him, and he basically said sleep apnea would not exist if the jaws were placed properly forward in the face, which brings up a pretty good question. Uh, I've been at this orthodontic game for 46 years, and when I was an orthodontic resident, I read the orthodontic literature on my own, uh, just took the journals home and read them all the way back to the early 1900s just to get a feel for the profession uh, and see where the history was. And, and if there's one thing I could conclude is that, in general, most of what we do in orthodontics is retractive in nature, sometimes purposefully, but many times we don't even know we're doing it. Now, you asked the question, can retraction cause the growth of the lower face to change? Well, let's not have me answer that. Let's just look at the literature, and you can decide if you think that's the case. So here out of the referee literature is a case where we have a young eight-year, eight-month-old boy who has missing upper lateral incisors, and the picture here shows the primary lateral incisors in place. And so from this point onward to the next picture here, he has some expansion of the maxillary arch, which is fine to do in my opinion. Expansion is lovely, wonderful. And you see the upper incisor comes downward and forward, kind of like we've been taught. But let's look even more closely and you see that the lower jaw comes forward dramatically. I mean substantially. In this four-year time frame, his lower jaw has come forward massively on its own, as we've all been taught that this is the way people grow. Now, the next thing, the next slide here shows that he, he has the upper cuspids are coming in, and he has about a four millimeter space mesial to each cuspid because there's a missing lateral. So obviously the orthodontist makes the choice of opening up the space another two to two and a half millimeters to make room for, uh, for a lateral incisor implant, or do what still is very commonly done, which is making cuspids into the lateral incisors. And they're always, we, the orthodontists always say, well, we'll bring the cuspids forward into that space. But in reality, is that what really happens? The cuspids don't really come forward. Think about anchorage con, uh, considerations with two central incisor teeth being the anchorage. Are they going to sit there and not move back and bring all the cuspids and bicuspids and molars, each with three roots forward? What do you think really happens? What really happens is that you retract the upper and central incisors, and you see that clearly here. And for those of you who are comfortable retracting, that's, you're going to have to live with this. But the fact is, I believe this is just a classic example of what happens frequently, because now look at what's happened to the formerly forward-growing lower jaw. In this next, from age 12 years, 10 months to 14 years, 5 months, the mandible, which had been previously growing forward massively, 4, 5, or 6 millimeters, as you saw in the previous slide, is not moving forward even minutely. It's basically converted this boy's growth into vertical growth. <clears throat> Here's a patient of my own where it's showing what I believe is not okay. If you'll see the first picture on the left, pre-treatment picture, this young man had had four bicuspid teeth enucleated, not by me, but by someone else in a town near where I used to practice. That enucleation means extracting the teeth before they erupt. He had what I termed a very moderate amount of crowding. The teeth were extracted. In the post-ortho picture, you'll see what he looks like after I treated him because he transferred into my practice and I just straightened his teeth. <clears throat> then you see him one year later and you see him two years later. And you can see that what looks like his nose is growing, but it really isn't. In reality, we put these red lines on here, and you can see how his cheek is flattening rather dramatically as the retraction has occurred. You say, so what? He has flat cheeks and a big-looking nose. Well, it's not that simple. Look at the distance between his neck and the forward position of his chin. And if you understand that the genioglossus muscle is attached to the inside of the, uh, of the, uh, the pagonion region, then you understand there's a good chance that his airway has been compromised rather dramatically. 
So here we have a representation of a garden hose on the left, which is a pretty good airway to breathe through, and then you see a drinking straw and in the middle, and on the right you see a cocktail straw. For those of you who have cone beam x-rays and can actually look at the airway in 3D, I came up with this uh, uh, metaphor probably 15 years ago, uh, maybe even 20 years ago, before I ever had a cone beam x-ray. I didn't really know what the cross-section looked like. But in reality, now that I've had a cone beam x-ray for more than a decade, I know that these are actually fairly accurate. And I do see patients who have airways that are bigger, no bigger than a drinking straw, and I've seen some that are no bigger than a cocktail straw. Is there another way? Well, certainly there, I would hope there is, and that's what this is all about. I'm here to try to help you understand that I believe there is another way. So let's look at a young man who was referred to me uh, by uh, someone <clears throat> uh, from Seattle. Actually, it's not a young man. Let's look at this <clears throat> patient who is referred to us for treatment. And we can discuss, gee, my gosh, she's got crowded lower incisors. Should we treat that now or should we treat it later? And the fact of the matter is, what are we focusing on? We're focusing on teeth. And that this seminar, which I'm giving you here, is not gonna focus on teeth. We could wait, we could treat her now, we could expand the arches, we could wait till the teeth are all in. Some people, including me in the past, would remove primary cuspids here to allow the other teeth to line up. That would be the last thing I would ever do, but I used to do that. And I, now I know it only makes the crowding worse, so I never do that anymore. But what if we were to take her upper front teeth and literally take these upper front teeth and move them forward right now, 10 millimeters forward in her face in this class one occlusion patient? Can you imagine doing that? What if we were then able to develop the lower jaw forward without a headgear effect? Think about that. So here we have, we've pushed the upper front teeth forward like this. We made our upper front teeth stick out. They protrude, don't they? <clears throat> then we develop the mandible forward using an appliance which negates the headgear effect and help her learn to keep her lips together and breathe through her nose. And as she does, the profile improves. You see the lower teeth have come forward now to meet the upper teeth, and the upper teeth no longer appear to protrude. The upper teeth haven't moved back, back even minutely from where we put them. For those of you who have been taught that you have to take out teeth because you're going to get recession, please look at this. Uh, if, you, if we've been taught we have, if we advance the teeth, we're going to cause recession. I was taught that, and people are still being taught that. Uh, later on here, I'm going to share with you, I believe I have seven articles that will uh, ease, your, ease your mind on that, seven articles from the referee literature that say that's not going to happen. So here, the, the good news is uh, her mother says she's no longer tired all the time, and she's two grades ahead in most of her coursework. The x-ray on the left shows her pre-treatment, and you can see her chin is back, the x-ray was actually taken when she had primary teeth, and we actually waited for the permanent teeth to come in uh, to do the orthotropics. But you can see that the minimal cross-section area was 13.1 square millimeters. On the right-hand side, this was an x-ray taken after we'd done the orthotropic treatment to advance both the maxilla and the mandible, and her minimal cross-section area was from 186.1 uh, square millimeters, putting her in a very uh, a remote chance of having sleep apnea. Her mother looked at these x-rays and says, I think I'm going to cry. She was incredibly happy about what she saw here. A dramatic improvement in the, in the airway uh, because we moved the upper teeth forward and the lower jaw came forward. Taking her from a very high probability of having sleep apnea to one with a very low probability. <clears throat> so here's the patient from Chicago I uh, was talking about previously. I thought it's in a different order. This patient is coming here from Chicago to Los Angeles to see me, referred by a sleep physician in Chicago. Because he has failure to thrive, he is also pure Robin sequence. But he's got uh, pediatric obstructive sleep apnea, and of course he has failure to thrive. He's not secreting growth hormone because he's not getting into deep sleep and he's not getting REM sleep and human growth hormone is not being secreted properly. So we did our orthotropic thing, and you can see his airway improving from the left to the right. And it, we, again, this treatment involves advancing the maxillary anterior teeth dramatically, usually 8 to 10 millimeters, 
and then developing the lower jaw forward with an appliance which negates the headgear effect. The appliance has some flanges which hold, are down into the, the floor of the, the mouth, and if the lower jaw if the lower jaw falls back, it signals the patient to keep the jaw forward so that the lower jaw is not hooked to the upper jaw, retracting the upper teeth back. This is how orthotropics differs from every other uh, system uh, of so-called functional appliances. The orthotropics uh, appliances are not referred to as functional appliances. They are known as postural appliances because their goal is to change rest oral posture and have every patient become a nasal breather. You can see the cross-section of his airway went from something a little bit bigger than drinking straw to that, which in this case was big enough to get rid of his sleep apnea. This case was then written up by Steve Sheldon and Kevin Boyd. Steve Sheldon is head of Lurie Children's Hospital uh, Pediatric Sleep Program and uh, published in Steve Sheldon's book showing that the boy's sleep apnea is completely gone. And Dr. Sheldon was very, very happy about this. <clears throat> Uh, and lectured to the Illinois uh, sleep physicians about orthotropics being one of the most important things is in his entire career. So we now show you a study of, that was published in Cranio on consecutively treated patients, uh, ortho, the patients that I treated orthotropically in my practice starting about 20 years ago. And what we found with those patients is a dramatic increase in the airway. We average good patients and bad patients here, and so the numbers might have been better. But you can see a 31% increase in the airway at the dorsum of the palate. At the level of the posterior airway space, that increase was 23%. And even down below, at the level of the hypopharynx here, uh, the, the increase was 9%. Now, I've shown these uh, to many sleep physicians, and they're, they're rather impressed, to say the least. Uh, this, you may notice, the patient that's shown on is a class two patient. And what did we do with that class two patient? We took the maxillary anterior teeth and moved them forward eight to 10 millimeters and then moved the mandible forward. You can also see the nice improvement in her profile. This patient, by the way, had, had received an opinion from another orthodontist that four bicuspid teeth needed to be removed and she needed to wear a headgear. So how important is this whole sleep apnea thing for a child? Ron Harper from UCLA tells us just how important it is. In his studies using MRIs on brains, he tells us that five hours of intermittent hypoxia can cause brain damage, killing Purkinje cells, which are responsible for motor coordination. He also says that brain injury from sleep apnea can result in a three to four time increased risk of hypertension. We're not talking about teeth here, are we? We're talking about health and longevity for our patients. And when you consider the number of kids who have these issues right now in your practice and everybody else's practice, and maybe even your own children or grandchildren, this now comes home to be very important. <clears throat> so the point here is that forward movement is what matters. But the sad part is the standard of care is still to retract. So let's look at a patient here. Let's go up the ladder here and go a little bit <laughs> Older. Here's a girl who's nine years and 10 months of age, and she's had a cleft palate repaired at, <clears throat> early on at age 10 months, a soft, a soft uh, cleft of her soft palate, not of her lip. And you see a rather substantial amount of crowding here, and she snores and sleeps with her mouth open, has difficulty eating. Is this a case where you think extraction of teeth would be necessary? Do you think it's possible to treat or even desirable to treat her without removing teeth? If you, were to remove, if you were to treat her without removing teeth, do you think you'd push these teeth off of the bone support and cause these teeth to be lost? That's what I was taught in orthodontic training, uh, that if I were to treat this without removing teeth, I would surely cause bone loss and probable loss of teeth. Look at her face using the Bolton norm prof, uh, profile norm superimposed on her face. The Bolton norm, for those of you who don't know, is derived from a Bolton brush study in Cleveland, Ohio, in the 1930s and 40s, when children were ex from age 8 to 18 were x rayed each year. These were children who were chosen because they were very attractive. And we superimposed that norm on the, on the soft tissue of the forehead and, and glabella and on the bridge of the nose. And it shows how far back the maxilla and mandible are in her case. If you then look at her airway, it's at 65.2 square millimeters, minimal cross-section, 
which is just, uh, <coughs> if it were below 52, she'd be in a high probability. So she's in a moderate probability right now uh, of having sleep apnea right now. What's going to happen if we retract even minutely? You think about that. Seeing her airway in cross-section, you can see it in another way here. So here she is. We've actually treated her. And in the course, we talk about how can you treat a case like this without removing teeth. Uh, here she has an overjet, and she has an open bite. And this is a finished case, which I'm incredibly proud of. You say, well, her teeth don't fit like gears. I understand that. I have eyes, too. I can see that. No, they don't fit ideally. They really don't. I admit that. But the parents report that her snoring is gone. And <clears throat> I offered jaw surgery to her, her and her parents. Uh, but they decided that wasn't what they wanted, and they were happy with this result. And they were offered the treatment to make the teeth fit ideally, and they chose not to. Incidentally, these people were driving 400 miles one way to see me to have this treatment done, and they did that for probably 15 to 20 visits because they couldn't find someone where they lived that was willing to do this. These people were elated and happy. Uh, and you can look at it and say, well, gee, she doesn't have any incisal guidance and all this stuff. She has no cuspid guidance. Yeah, I get that, too. I understand that. Uh, so here we see just what it started out looking like, and here it is now. And here is the lower arch. What I want you to look at is her smile from, one, from the left to the right. And are you worried about recession here? There's a nice close-up view for you to see if you think that's a concern. I wouldn't do this kind of treatment if I thought there was a chance of a recession and losing the teeth. I mean, I'm not crazy, but I'm not about to retract somebody here. <clears throat> one of my mentors in my life that I believe is one of the brightest orthodontists ever to live is Brendan Stack, who sadly is now retired. But I took seminars from him back in the 1980s, and here's a quote from him. Uh, he's somebody who, if you don't know who he is, go Google his name and see what he does with uh, some of the patients who have motion disorders. He's one of the most brilliant men I've ever known in my life. Privileged to know Brendan Stack and call him a friend. Here he is speaking uh, in the year 2011, talking about incisal guidance as one of the worst concepts foisted on the dental profession. So I, happen, I have been reopening extraction spaces for people since 1989, and I couldn't agree more uh, with Brendan Stack on that very issue. <clears throat> For those of you who are concerned about causing recession, uh, this slide shows six references, and I can give the, I, will, I have them for the people who will be attending my seminar, the actual references. There are actually now I have seven references, essentially saying that you can dramatically advance teeth in the face without causing recession, and these are all in the refereed literature, but almost universally ignored in our profession, even though they're in our own refereed literature. So giving our, air, uh, our patients better airways can actually involve breaking all of the rules. Here's another patient we can look at. <clears throat> Here we have a young boy with an end-on-end -end class two relationship, and in my training I was taught to use a headgear, and if he didn't wear a headgear to fix the class two, then I was going to take out the upper bicuspid teeth and retract him back. Well, I quit doing that more than 35 years ago. But let's talk about another way to fix that, okay? Look at this airway for him, and he's a big guy, uh, way over six feet, and weighs way over 200 pounds now. He used to play football in high school. And his airway was very small, not good. We don't want to do anything to make it worse. So here we use a lower appliance that we're going to actually open some space with. And this is called a sagittal appliance, and we'll show these with great detail in, the, in our seminar on how to do this. But we're actually going to advance his eight lower front teeth. And again, please look at the gum tissue here, the gingival tissue in the anterior, to see if we're causing recession. <clears throat> in the midst of the treatment, we've opened up a space almost big enough for a bicuspid implant. And in other cases, we've actually done that. He didn't want to have a bicuspid implant, so we placed temporary anchor devices here and used elastics back to the molars to bring the back teeth forward and close all that space forward and keep the lower anterior teeth forward where we had placed them. Here is a panoramic x-ray showing how, with the removal of plants, the reciprocal of advancing lower incisors had pushed the other teeth back so that the second molar was actually impacted into the uh, 
the vertical part of the ramus. When we're all done, we've brought all these teeth forward. You can see that the temporary anchors devices are still in place, but the, all this space has been closed forward. And he has a class three molar relationship because we've literally brought his entire lower dentition forward without doing surgery to advance his mandible. But effectively, we have brought his lower teeth forward. And again, please look and see if you think there's a problem with recession. <clears throat> Now let's look at his face, pre-treatment and post-treatment. I believe that his face, facial profile, post-treatment actually is better, certainly better than if we'd retracted him. And now let's look at where the, the rubber meets the road, about his airway. He's gone from a 60.2 millimeter minimal cross-section to 150.4, gone from a, almost a high-risk group for sleep apnea to one of a very low-risk group. The next thing I want to bring your attention to is the bone on the labial aspect of the lower incisors. On the lower right, you see a massive amount of bone on the labial aspect of the lower incisors after I've advanced these teeth rather substantially. Again, I'm presenting to you the fact that we've been taught doing something like this would cause recession and bone loss, and you can see for yourself right here that has absolutely not occurred. I like to follow up with my patients and some of them are on Facebook, and here he is with his grandmother and his sister, who actually did orthotropics. And here is his next birthday, age 21. He's still having a good time with his grandmother. So <clears throat> it's now 29 years since I reopened extraction spaces for this woman, and uh, I learned a lot since that. I didn't just go in and say, oh, I'm going to start reopening extraction spaces. She actually forced me to try to do it. And I've, been, I've done it for hundreds of people over those years, but I really am a slow learner uh, in this because it only dawned on me a few years ago that when we're doing this, we're actually dealing with a syndrome. Uh, and here out of Wikipedia, a syndrome is a set of medical signs and symptoms that are correlated with each other and often with a specific disease. And I really believe that we have a syndrome, and I've named this syndrome <clears throat> the Extraction Retraction Regret Syndrome. Now, every time I've shown this slide, people in the audience have laughed. And I kind of, when I came up with this, I kind of laughed a little bit too. But here it is, it's the ERRS, and I've actually trademarked the term, and trademarked the term that it's actually preventable syndrome. I've, I, and I define it as follows. It is a constellation of aesthetic, functional, and emotional signs and symptoms caused by tongue space airway reduction from orthodontic retraction, all of which are preventable, because retraction is a choice. It is preventable. <clears throat> That's why we call it the preventable syndrome. But it has this triad of aesthetic, functional, and emotional things which affect almost every one of these patients. That doesn't mean that every person who is retracted is going to have this problem happen. But do you want to take the chance that you're going to treat someone and cause these problems? That's my point. These are the kinds of complaints that people make all the time. They're just a few of the many for the aesthetic challenges that we see. Let's take someone who, uh, who uh, has a, mainly an aesthetic concern. And so that's what she came to me for because she didn't like her small smile. <clears throat> She'd had four bicuspid teeth, take, teeth taken out as a child, and she wants a better smile. And she's got a slight click in the right joint, but no pain to palpation. And her, her face, if you look at the bold norm, her face is sunken in right in the mid-facial region where her teeth were taken out and retracted back. Her airway is really not an issue. She's got a great airway. So from a functional perspective, she's not someone with a big problem. We've reopened the spaces here for her, and you can see those spaces in the lower right is pretty small. Here she is after she's had four implants placed and she's been fully restored. And many of these patients will choose to have restoration done, not all of them, but, but some do, particularly those who have wear from clenching and grinding and, and all. So here's her smile before we expand, uh, develop her teeth back forward. Here she is after the treatment, but before she has implants placed, and here she is after the implants have been placed and all of her teeth have been restored. And you can look at that here in a portrait that she sent to us. Again, you can see side by side before treatment, after the orthodontics, and then we look at after the orthodontics and post-restoration. And 
pre-treatment versus post-restoration. She's a very, very happy person. These are the kinds of things we're going to be teaching in our upcoming seminar. The exact how-to cookbook, A, first of all, diagnose which cases can and should be treated, but more than that, how to do it. You can see how our profile was nicely filled out in the process. This is a preventable syndrome. <clears throat> Functional challenges, have clicking jaw joints, pain in and around the, the TMJ and muscles, face, and all that kind of thing. This brings us to the next subject, which is mandibular entrapment. We'll discuss that in our seminar. The biggest, and that is the biggest reason you have TMJ pain patients in your practice. Here, for instance, is a typical class one occlusion that we see all the time, and a patient that I've taken out teeth in, uh, patients like this many times prior to 35 years ago when I pretty much stopped taking teeth out. But you see no crowding on the upper, and there's crowding on the lower. Uh, so let's look at what happens technically. This is what we show happens when you take out teeth in the lower. We line the lower teeth up like this, and you end up with that amount of space. On the upper arch, there's no crowding at all. So you take out the teeth, and there's a large eight millimeter space where the tooth was taken out. Now you see what the patient looks like in the midst of the treatment. The lower teeth are aligned, but, and there's just a little space yet to close. In the upper, there's plenty of space to close because those teeth were aligned in the beginning. Then the space is closed on the lower arch completely and closed somewhat on the upper, but there's still space to close. So what is going to happen then when you look at the fact that the upper and lower incisors are in contact right now? What happens when you continue to bring the upper teeth back and close the extraction spaces when the upper incisors are in contact with the lowers like this? This then is a nice depiction of what's happening. You're pushing back on the upper incisors and ultimately, you're pushing on the lower incisors, and that's pushing the mandible back, and that pushes the condyle back into the back part of the fossa, which is pretty much never a good thing. So when you then take an x-ray of patients like this, you'll often see the condyles are distalized in a position like this, and that's not good. Patients like this often present with pain patterns. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to be discussing in our upcoming seminar. Uh, this and much more, we'll talk about uh, other kinds of cases, reopening extraction spaces in sleep apnea cases, uh, pain patients, we got plenty of those. Uh, we'll talk about adding extra teeth in patients who are not missing teeth. We'll talk about reopening missing lateral incisor spaces, we'll talk about a lot of different things. But this gives you a taste of what's really going on. And, and with, our, with our seminar. Thank you, Bill. Bill's going to be hosting a two-day event in Las Vegas later this year. The event will be held at the ARIA Hotel on September 21st and 22nd, and you will earn 16 CE credits if you choose to attend. The name of the event is Opening Minds, Reopening Extraction Spaces, and Advancing Airway Health. And over those two days, Bill, Bill will be sharing his overall treatment philosophy and teaching very specific treatment techniques for patients 10 years of age and older. A big part of this seminar will be devoted to showing you exactly how to reopen previously closed extraction spaces. This is an in-demand treatment that's a win for everyone. It's a win for your patient with alleviation of symptoms, airway improvement, and better facial aesthetics. It's a win for you as a doctor by giving you an opportunity to treat the whole patient. And it's a win for your practice because it's a treatment that cannot be delivered by Smile Direct or your local competitors, and it does tend to demand a higher fee than most other orthodontic treatments. Finally, it's a win for your referral partners because it creates a myriad of restorative opportunities. Again, the event will be held at the ARIA in Las Vegas on September 21st and 22nd, and because you registered for this webinar, you will be receiving emails about the event, and we hope to see you there. And thanks again for joining us.